Welcome to Lawrence Center for Faith and Work Luncheon. We're so glad you could join us. I'm Dr. Faith, and that's my real name. That's what everyone calls me. And I serve as director of the center, and I also teach ethics here at the Offit School of Business. One of my favorite verses from scripture comes from Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 to 8, which says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let everyone see your gentleness. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. Instead, in every situation, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, tell your request to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is worthy of respect, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If something is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. See, I'm learning from um, my studies of positive psychology that Paul knew something when he was talking about this, and it's something that we all need to learn as 21st century humans. In a TED talk by Sean Archer, he talks about the happy secret to better work. So I'll let him tell you a little bit about he might have read this verse and, you know, did some psychology about it. Here's how we get the help. We need to reverse the formula for happiness and success. In the past three years, I've traveled to 45 different countries, working with schools and companies in the midst of an economic downturn. And what I found is that most companies and schools follow a formula for success, which is this. If I work harder, I'll be more successful. And if I'm more successful, then I'll be happier. That undergirds most of our parenting styles, our managing styles, the way that we motivate our behavior, and the problem is it's scientifically broken and backwards for two reasons. First, every time your brain has a success, you just change the goalpost of what success looked like. You got good grades, now you have to get better grades. You got into good school, now you have to get a better school. You got a good job, now you have to get a better job. You hit your sales target, we're gonna change your sales target. And if happiness is on the opposite side of success, your brain never gets there. What we've done is we push happiness over the cognitive horizon as a society. And that's because we think we have to be success successful, then we'll be happier. But the real problem is our brains work in the opposite order. If you can raise somebody's level of positivity in the present, then their brain experiences what we now call a happiness advantage, which is your brain in positive performs significantly better than it does in negative neutral stress. Your intelligence rises, your creativity rises, your energy levels rise. In fact, what we found is that every single business outcome improves. Your brain in positive is 31% more productive than it your brain in negative neutral stress. You're 37% better at sales. Doctors are 19% faster and more accurate at coming up with the correct diagnosis when positive instead of negative neutral or stress, which means we can reverse the formula. If we can find a way of becoming positive in the present, then our brains work even more successfully as we're able to work harder, faster, and more intelligently. What we need to be able to do is reverse this formula so we can start to see what our brains are actually capable of because dopamine, which floods into your system when you're positive, has two functions. Not only does it make you happier, it turns on all the learning centers in your brain. A lot of okay. Got it. So I say, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let us pray. Thank you, dear God, for giving us a manual through which to navigate life. Thank you for this beautiful day, for this wonderful group of humans, and for our speaker, Dan Malmstrom. Thank you for the meal before us. Bless the hands that made it and the hands serving us. And bless the fellowship around the table. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of things that should be on your tables. The first one is a conversation with Paul Davery on September 26th from 4 to 5.30 right here in the auditorium. It's an interview with President Kraft, and Paul will share reflections on his leadership as president of Concordia spanning five decades, and you're all welcome. And the second one is just a heads up. Our October speakers are Paul Richard and Loris Morbat. Please make, um, put that on your calendar and come be with us. Now for today. Dan Malmstrom graduated from Concordia in 82. He is the principal owner of North Point Professionals, a consulting firm offering strategic services to corporations, 
startups, nonprofits, and schools. He has authored several business curriculums and trained executives worldwide. He also is um, an entrepreneur who's had several tech related companies. And um, one of them called Be At Home, an internet home automation company, it achieved a claim leading to advisement with President George W. Bush on residential energy conservation. He served for 12 years as an executive for Great Plains Software Fargo and had a successful sales career at IBM Corporation and he just told us the story of how that happened. He might mention it in his remarks. He graduated from here with a degree in communications and business administration. So we are very proud of you because, you know, liberal arts, yay! <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Faith. I appreciate that greatly. And as I look across who's sitting at these tables, boy, it's, I am just humbled. And there's a big part of my DNA right now, and a big part of what I know about scripture in the realm of wisdom that would say I should be uh, quick to listen, slow to speak, and uh, really ask a lot of questions. That would be my preference today because there is so much um, knowledge, there's so much experience, there's so much vocational excellence that's represented right here. But Faith and Larry have been asking me to speak for a while, for a long while actually, because they've seen something quite transformational that I have been party to observing and also been party to affecting down Interstate 94. And it is transformational. And they want me to convey that because it's quite unusual, it's quite uncommon, and it's quite powerful in the spectrum of God's work. I have to tell you, beyond 1982, my graduation, I started my college career right here. Um, this was only known as East Complex back in the 1980s. There was no Grant Center, there was no Lorenzen Center, there was no office school of business. There weren't buildings over there, that was where we played intramural football. Um, got beat up pretty good. And uh, just one memory about this place because it was an auspicious start to a, a lot of things. In the basement of this building, I actually watched a miracle happen. In uh, 1980, in the winter, that's been about 40 years ago, a group of us went down to the basement of this building and we huddled over a bunch of chairs and old couches and one TV, and yes, it was a color TV, and we watched the United States U.S. hockey team defeat the Soviet Union in what was the most implausible sports events of all time. And this place went wild, I will just tell you. It was pr quite a fascinating event. And you know, from there, lots of good things happened from Concordia. And there's a name that I will reference just very quickly. My hero at Concordia is a, name, is a lady named Sylvia Lell, who w worked in the placement office at Concordia. There's a scholarship in her name um, into perpetuity because of what she did as a, as, a, as a woman with the virtues of Christ that saw into a situation and followed through on it and got I, IBM's first internship uh, for Concordia College for a young guy named Dan Malmstrom. And I will tell you, uh, I will forever be indebted to her. And there are many stories like that. You know, Concordia is a place where people, are, you know, they become prepared. They become prepared to affect the affairs of the world in a profound way. And I'm just one example, and there are many examples sitting right here. And I know that for sure because I've worked with some of you. Mike Sleddy, I've worked with Mike for 12 years, um, you know, and, and affecting the world in quite a profound way, and others sitting at this table here. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about what's happening on the corridor of I-94 a place where I've literally driven a couple hundred thousand miles over the years, and I've watched some transformational things happen in the area of vocational discipleship. So just to give you a lens into what I'm going to talk about, two primary things. One, the tools of our time for discipleship in the workplace, and secondly, the virtues of Christ 
that transcend our time that I see in the people that are part of this transformation. And hopefully at the end, you'll also have a sense of encouragement and maybe conviction on how you go about your own work and your own vocations, faith at work. So the backstory. This is going to take a little bit of time, but it's worth it. So after spending nearly 20 years, my wife Lisa is here. She was with the GLNS Advertising Agency, which eventually became Sundog. She worked with First Bank, Metropolitan Bank, the Norman Jones Organization, um, you know, doing advertising. And I was working at IBM, had a great career going on there, got recruited to this little company. Mike, I was, I don't know what my employee number was. Do you know? So somebody asked me, Tim Sandin asked me, it's like, what was your employee number? I said, I don't know. Everybody knows their employee number at Great Plains. I, I don't remember. Mike, I thought you'd know. <laughs> so did the Great Plains thing for 12 years, be at home, just a fascinating internet home automation company. And then Lisa and I formed a company called North Point Professionals, and we started helping other companies. So, you know, Bob Pope um, asked me to help two of his friends, Ray and Trevor Gruby, that had this little company called Gruby Technologies. And we went in and we basically re-engineered the company and their products, their technologies, and rebranded it to something called Intelligent Insights, which you probably all know about Intelligent Insights. We did that and we helped Jeff Johnson and this pioneer of, of patents in the NDSU Research Park named Barry Batchelor um, frame up and start Apario Business Systems. And Jeff is still there. And after doing that for 18 or 20 years here, Lisa and I decided, let's go back to Otter Tail and Douglas County and take what God has given us and help ordinary men and women accomplish extraordinary things in their organizations with the help of God. Simple as that. That's what we were called to do. So we went back. In about 2006, I got an email from a pastor in Ottertail County and basically said, hey, Dan, I know you do some speaking. Um, there's a group of business people that are doing an outing at the Viking Valley Hunt Club. Any of you know where that is? I-94 corridor. This is Dalton, Minnesota, okay? A group of businessmen are meeting there and they're gonna shoot some pheasants and clay pigeons and they want somebody to come in and do a couple of workshop sessions for them. And I thought of you, would you be willing to do that? And I said, okay, well, what are they, what are they looking for? Well, they're looking for a Christian businessman who could teach them some principles of leadership. And I told them that you came from Great Plains Software and everybody wants to hear about Great Plains Software. I said, yeah, 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 okay, I'll do that. I may have given them some nuggets of value. I was blessed by that event and it forever changed the course of what I would do for the next 20 years. These men had, one of them had received a vision from God that he was to transform and other business people, community leaders, law enforcement people in the Elk River area would commit their businesses and their vocations to the work of Jesus Christ in vocation to transform Elk River. This book is written about that vision and the 12 men that united together to do this. I listened to this story and I was fascinated at the Viking Valley Hunt Club. And I'm like, oh, and I've never heard anything like this in my life. They gave me the book. I read the book. I said, I got to go visit these guys. So I went and visited a couple of the businesses. Baudry Oil, Marksman's Metal. It was a real deal. It was all about caring for their customers, their employees, their community, each other, like I'd never seen. In one of those meetings, Ken Baudry, big oil company, completely turned over to God, says to me, Hey, Dan, any chance you would be willing to help out a guy in Alexandria, Minnesota? Because in the vision we received, it wasn't to stop at Elk River. We were to expand this vocational model to other communities in our area. I said, well, who are you talking about? He said, could you go up and help a guy who's trying to take this to Alexandria? His name is Vern Anderson. I said, Vern Anderson and Douglas Machine. He said, yeah, you know him? I said, Interestingly enough, my first year at IBM, which was a very good year, I ended up being the top salesperson in the IBM corporation, 20,000 salespeople, 1,700 rookies. Douglas Machine was my primary customer. They were a small manufacturing company, probably in the range of, I, I won't even give a range. They were a small manufacturing company. 
They were doing all of their large packaging machine designs for Coke, Pepsi, Procter & Gamble, machines that are the size of this room. They were designing them on, on draft boards with pencils. That's what their engineers were doing. We automated all of their ERP and all their computer-aided drafting systems, and they took off like crazy. Douglas Machine was my first customer. I had never seen Vern since then for 25 years. And Ken Baudry is saying, could you help this guy in Alexandria? I said, I think maybe so. We reconnected. Vern had me speak at a, a little group he had formed in Alexandria called the Unity Foundation, which is now more than a little group in Alexandria, Minnesota. Faith and Larry have been there. They know there is a culture and a fabric of vocational discipleship that is amazing. It started with this little thing. I spoke there a couple of times, and then Vern says to me, would you be willing to teach servant leadership and discipleship in something called the CEO Roundtable to business leaders, school superintendents, county sheriff, city mayor in Alexandria? 30 of them gathered for eight months. And myself, a guy named Mark Dieterding, who was a former COO of the Taylor Group, group Ten, uh, Glenn Taylor Group, and a retired pastor, Tracy Weaver, we taught servant leadership to these people for eight months. Afterwards, they had developed their own profile. And they said, we would like managers and supervisors in our organizations to go through the same thing. So the next year, we trained another 40 or 50. And the year after that, and the year after that, today in Alexandria, there are hundreds of leaders like you and me that are trained in servant leadership and have turned their vocations over to discipleship. What has happened in Alexandria is now happening and has happened to a degree in Wilmer, Hutchinson, and to a degree in Litchfield. The I-94 corridor is alive for the work of Jesus Christ in vocations. So that's the backstory. How did I end up here? Eric Johnson, former classmate, development office of Concordia, approached me and reconnected with me and said, hey, I want to help you and Lisa develop this scholarship for your hero, Sil Sylvia Lell. He came to Douglas Scientific in Alexandria, a company I had started in the area of bioengineering, robotics, and genetic sequencing and discovery. We're just a startup. We maybe have 30 or 40 employees. Eric comes down there. He walks through the doors. He goes, Dan, what is going on here? I have never experienced anything like this in a company. I said, God's on fire here, and it's in all the people. He says, I can see it. I can feel it. They're loving on me, and they don't even know me. I said, Eric, this is not, this is not uncommon. This is... This is every company in Alexandria. This is the school system. This is the way it is. This is the culture of Jesus Christ alive. And he said, I got to bring some more people from Concordia to see this. He brought President Kraft to Douglas Scientific. He was there. He saw the robotics that were feeding starving people around the world from Alexandria, finding diseases that nobody else could find with our robotics. He saw it. Larry and Faith came a couple of times. And they came to the Unity Foundation events, and they saw there is something different about Alexandria. Am I right? Yeah. That's why I'm here. That's the backstory. Thank you, Eric Johnson, for having a heart for this. So what would I like to talk to you about today? Tools, virtues of what has been trans transformational in these organizations. And I guess the way I'd like to start it is every generation, every generation, I believe, has been equipped with the tools, exactly the tools that we need by God for us to do our work. You know, there are new tools that are kind of like emerging that I don't have a clue about. Some of the social media tools and, you know, the analytics, you know, those weren't my tools. But I feel fortunate that I grew up in the 1980s and 1990s in my career, and there were some amazing thinkers. You know, this is just a sampling of the books that I've read over time that have really influenced my own paradigm for leadership, secular and in the, vo in the vocational spectrum. Many others, but these are some of them that framed it up. 
And, you know, with IBM, I went to professional development six weeks every year. I was sent away to MIT, you know, Stanford, Harvard, Princeton, and I got, you know, rubbed shoulders with some of the greatest minds. And some of those minds, you know, whether it's Drucker or Porter, or Stephen Covey, Collins, you know, uh, Kaplan and Norton with the balanced scorecard, Harvard Business School, they were great thinkers and they had great tools. Tools for my time to be effective in vocation, but they were amazingly effective when they were seen through the lens of the biblical ethic. Great tools. I was been, I've been blessed with something else. At Great Plains Software, I got to work with people like Mike Sledy and Doug Burgum. Jeff Johnson was there. Gary Inman was there. There were many people. They were just fabulous, smart people. But Doug just had an association with some smart people, too. Doug Burgum, governor of North Dakota, he was leading you know, um, Great Plains Software. We literally, I'm not kidding you, these guys can attest to this, we rub shoulders with people like Bill Gates, Steve Ballmer, Steve Jobs, Scott McNeely. They were in our company. We got to see how they operated. Great minds. And through these great minds, oh, by the way, I should say something else. Um, I was blessed with something else. Some of you would call it an absolute curse. God used things that are curses to be, be for good. I'm completely deaf. I have zero hearing. Yeah, you're looking at me like, are you kidding me? Uh, yeah, this is, I'm bionic. Um, I have no hearing at all. And um, I knew when I was about 35 years old through genetics, uh, genetic um, familial um, discovery down at Mayo Clinic that both my brother and I carried a mutant gene um, from our mother and we would become deaf. Mike knew this when I was at Great Plains Software. I was losing my hearing. I had six sets of digital hearing aids. But by the time I was about 40, I could not listen to music. I could not listen to go to movies. I could not watch television. Um, the noise of the world actually went down to nothing, literally nothing. So by the time I was about 47 years old, I'm deaf. Well, you know what, when you're deaf and there's a noise of the world, you kind of fall back onto what you really like to do. It's learn and read anyway. I'm a voracious reader, okay? So I read all this stuff and I continue to read all this stuff. And I saw the tools of greatness from these minds. But as Doug Burgum would say of me, and Mike might even remember this, he said it at the Arthur School one day when he was giving me some accolades. And he said, you know, Dan is one of the few people on earth that sees the world from 30,000 feet, but he knows exactly what to do at three feet. And you know what? I actually prefer three feet. All right, I like to change my own oil, mow my own lawn, and, you know, write my own software and dashboards and do quality control on Jeff's software, which he probably didn't like sometimes at Be At Home. But I, I like being involved directly. And these tools that I learned about and read about, I was applying them with tools and organizations and continue to do so, but all of that and all of this greatness in those great minds was applied through the biblical ethic and applied through the biblical ethic up and down I-94 in schools, Alexandria Public Schools, new vision for a school there, right? Glendale State Park, Battle Lake, we have Brad Hoganson from Hillcrest Lutheran Academy. There is a complete new continuum of Christian classical education going on in Fergus Falls right now that is part of a vision using some of these tools, all the way through seminary, all right? Pretty cool stuff going on. But there's all tools that are available to us in our time and our generation. Now today I'm just gonna give you two examples, because I could go through some of these that are more detailed, but they're tailored to specific organizations. So I'm gonna focus on two, real quick, that I think are common to everybody in the room, right? The first one would be the area of mission, right? So, you might say, you're not going to talk to us about mission, are you? Yeah, I am. I'm going to talk to you about mission because, you know, for a lot of organizations, there's a mission statement and it becomes shelfware. It's actually on your website. It might be on a business card and nobody knows what it is. Leaders understand mission impeccably well and they understand it is the glue that holds organizations together in thick and thin, beyond technology, beyond your great works. It is the glue. You guys know what I'm going next with this. Because at Great Plains Software, there was not an employee meeting that didn't start with Doug Burgum standing up and reciting the mission and asking for examples about how we were living out the mission and values. That's where it started. I found that particularly odd when I came from IBM because all the IBM executives were talking about this great new software, the research coming out of the Watson Labs, and here's how we're going to change the world. And Doug gets up there and talks about mission? Really? 
Well, I saw where, his, where he was going with that. Because, you know, in a startup, in a small organization, it matters. I'm 20 plus years removed from Great Plains Software. You guys are probably not far behind me. To improve the life and business success of partners and customers by providing superior, uh, superior software services and tools. All right, it wasn't like I just knew that it could be cited. Because we all lived it, right? It was like you went to work. You know, when you woke up in the morning, you had to put that foot down on the side of your bed. Am I going to go face that, you know, those dragons I got every day? I'm improving the life and business success of people around the world. And Doug just, he reinforced that. Mission is important. But you know what? He wasn't the God of mission. Jesus Christ is the greatest example of reiterating mission. And, and you guys follow with me. I, I call it the two cents of Jesus Christ on discipleship, on discipleship mission. And I, I love that. You know, here we got an ordinary guy, God man. He comes out of, you know, little Nazareth. He's a carpenter his whole life. And then he walks down to the Jordan River. He gets baptized by John the Baptist. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, powered by the Holy Spirit, goes, gets tempted by the devil, right? And then he goes back to Galilee into Nazareth and walks into the synagogue on Sunday. Well, what happens? He asks to read, which is customary in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Luke, chapter 4. He opens to that place where it's said about him, Isaiah 61, as we would know it, right? The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me, that's the first sent, he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He closed the scroll, handed back to the attendant, and all eyes were fixed on him. And he said, today, in the reading and in your hearing, this scripture has been fulfilled. Wow. Okay. Mission. He proclaimed and articulated what the mission for his discipleship was going to look like. Other bookend, John 20, 21. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. He's leaving. So, as the Father sent me, the second sent, I am sending you. To do what? Exactly what the Father sent him to do. But here's how Jesus Christ was actually a little bit like Doug Burgum, or Doug like Jesus Christ. 38 times between those two bookends, he used the word sent. As the Father sent me, I was sent to. As I was sent to, he was reinforcing the mission that he was sent to live out. I just find that incredibly powerful in terms of mission. And we all have mission in our organizations. The question is, do we have vocational missions that are shared by each other? That, by the people you're sitting with in your organizations. Now, lest Jesus Christ thought we didn't understand what the outcomes were of his balanced scorecard, he made it abundantly clear in Luke chapter 15 and 16. You know the stories, all right? The lost, he, made, he made sure we'd all get it because he gave us three examples. Find anywhere in scripture where he had to give us three times to reinforce how important it was to his disciples, us. The lost sheep, 100, 99, I'm going to leave to find the one. I'm going to search until I find the one. And when I find the one, there's a celebration in heaven. Right? I'm going to talk fast here. And there's the lost son. And the father waits in earnest, looks in earnest for his son to come back because he wants him restored to the family. And then there's my favorite the 10 coins, the single woman, the hardworking woman who has 10 coins and one is lost. And she turns her house upside down and she looks for how long? Until she's kind of tired? No. Until she's going to give up? No. She looks until that precious coin is found. Mission, the outcome is a precious coin in the image of Jesus Christ secured for eternity. What are we sent to do in our vocations? Not all of us may be disciples. I'm hoping that all of your salvation is secured through grace and faith, but do our works represent the justification of that mission that we were given? 
Down I-94, it is alive. Here's an example of mission in one of the companies. This comes right off from the Douglas Machine Corporation website. Their mission is a God-given mission and their values are abundantly clear to any customer, to any supplier, to any employee that's looking at whether or not they want to have an association with Douglas Machine Corporation. Now, is this meant to exclude anyone? No, if you're Douglas Scientific or Douglas Machine, I tell you, Douglas Scientific, we ended up with 110 employees. About half of them came from other parts of the world. Right? We're in optics, we're in bioengineering. Some of the best minds came from Pakistan, came from um, India, came from China. Optics engineers, they all came from China. Were, were they bringing a Christian faith into the workplace? Did they look at our value system and said, well, I can't go to work there because they operate with a biblical ethic? To the contrary. We didn't exclude anyone, but it was really clear to anybody who came to work and did business with us how we made decisions, how we treated our employees and our customers, how we gave back to our community, how we shared with each other, how we did life together, why we did Bible studies at 6 in the morning on financial peace and introduction to the Bible and marriage and parenting. They knew why we did what we did. By the way, this is not an anomaly. Go to Agard, go to Alexandria Industries, go to Douglas Scientific, go to pretty much any company in Alexandria that's part of the Unity Foundation, and there are hundreds, and you will find things that look like this. Not meant to exclude, but meant to be very clear how we have turned our businesses and vocations and schools and organizations over to Jesus Christ. Discipleship. So that's just one example. The other tool is vision. And um, please, I'm not going to try to sound disrespectful here, but when people say, well, Dan, you're a visionary, or Doug Burgum, you're a visionary, or Jeff, you're a visionary, or Barry Bachelor is a visionary, I chuckle. And the reason I chuckle is we're all visionaries. What is vision? It's the ability to see yourself in a in a preferred situation or destination at a different point in time. That's vision. You probably have vision what you're going to do this weekend. It's vision. It's simple. The real difference is, you know, scope and scale. Steve Jobs is big vision. You know, Elon Musk, big vision. But we all are visionaries. The, the thing I have seen where leaders really have a distinction when it comes to this topic of vision are two elements. And I see it played out so well. One is the word shared. Right? Is it your vision or is there power in the shared vision? And I've actually got one chapter of one book in the secular spectrum that's my favorite, written by a guy named Peter Senge. All right? The book is The Fifth Discipline. The chapter is on shared vision. And Senge would basically say it this way. Shared vision is an answer to the question of what do we, we, want to create? And he would say that if you and I, whether it's Great Plains Software or Alexandria Industries, or Alexandria Public Schools, if we have a common picture of what it is we have been given by vision, maybe vision by God, there is nothing more powerful in the spectrum of human affairs. I couldn't agree more. Nothing more powerful in the spectrum of human affairs. But vision can't be relegated to just a vision statement. He would say create a clear picture. When Lisa and I have helped organizations with visioning process. It's not we're going to end up with a vision statement and some bullet points. No, there's like 10 to 20 pages of prose that's refined, vetted, that describe this preferred future. Because if we have a common picture, we will be united to pursue that picture. So this got played out many times during, uh, down the I-94 <coughs> corridor as well. Alexandria Industries, a fifth, one of the largest employers in Alexandria. Right, larger than Douglas Machine Corp. Four and a half years ago, they asked Lisa and I to facilitate a vision. Well, they don't just do vision with all the tools that Lisa and I know how to use, primary research, secondary research, let's look at trends, discontinuities, let's look at your finances and all the metrics and the balance scorecard, and look at new products where we can go. No, that's not where they start. They start with this, prayer. Why did it start with prayer? Because here's the humility that you will find across Alexandria. We have smart people 
really well-educated and experienced people, but the source of all vision and wisdom is there. They would, they would align with Proverbs chapter 8, where, vi- where wisdom speaks in the first person. Wisdom says, I was the first of God's creations. I was with him at the formation of all things. God and wisdom were side by side. These people in Alexandria, and they do vision, whether it's Alexandria Public Schools or otherwise, are praying to God first, not after they've developed a human wisdom. First, God, provide your wisdom to the process. It's amazing to see what happens. Alexandria Industries in their process, four and a half years later, doubled in size and gave back to the community in such profound ways I can't even begin to express it here today. We have uh, Mr. Buckholtz here today. He's another Great Plains pioneer, probably even way ahead of me in terms of employee numbers. Nice to see you. So what should you expect when you invite God into the process? I got to make this part quick. God shows up in unexpected ways, ways that teach you. Douglas Scientific, we changed the world. It was pretty profound. But God entered in a place that I couldn't even have fathomed. My administrative assistant comes into one of my management team meetings. This was probably in about 2012, I'd say, 13. She said, I, I've got a strange phone call that just happened, and I think you're going to need to attend to it right away. And I said, what? What, Michelle? She said, I got a phone call, and a guy, he's, he says he has a word from the Lord for you. And he wants just a few minutes of your time. And I said, well, who is he? Well, he said his name is Alan. And I said, Alan, Alan Ross. And I said, I don't know an Alan Ross. Where's where's he from? From a church in town or what? No, he's from Glasgow, Scotland. I said, what? Scotland in Alexandria? And he has a word of the Lord for me. Well. I better not turn that down. (laughs) So I said, send him over. This is the business card I got. He sits down in my office, introduces himself, and he said, Dan, I'm a pastor of a church in Scotland. I'm not a prophet, but I have the gift of prophecy. And the Lord has given me um, a word for you. I don't know your business. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you do. But if you don't mind, I'll just tell you what it is. And I said, okay. I said, this hasn't happened to me recently. Um, And um, he pulls out a tape recorder. Literally, it was a tape recorder, not a phone with a video or, you know, a voice recorder. It was a tape recorder. And I I said, what's that? And he goes, well, if you don't mind, I'd like to record it. And I'm going to leave you with an audio file. And I said, well, why? He goes, I may never see you again, but I want you to have evidence of how God is going to be faithful to what I am going to say to you in the next few minutes. Eight minutes, he just talked. All right, I just listened. Afterwards, he left. It was quick. We had no friendship, no relationship. He leaves. I've never seen him again. Okay? My team and I, we transcribed this. There's 28 bullet points there. I'm not going to go through them all. But you know what? They've been fulfilled. And there are things in there that are uncommon. He said, Douglas Scientific is going to be an apostolic mantle to the nations. We're a team at the time of about 50 people. We ended up being in 17 countries and feeding the worlds. There were articles written about Douglas Scientific that we had no idea were even being written. One of them was in the Bangkok Post, small little community. The Bangkok Post, title of the article was Feeding the Masses. And our technologies had allowed molecular assisted breeding of new hybrids that saved millions of people from starvation. He said we were going to be an apostolic mantle. He said we were going to influence the most influential people in the world. It's one of the points up here. Within one year, we had calls and people in Alexandria, guys like the name Heiner Dreisman. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Heiner Dreisman. He is the former CEO of Roche Diagnostics, the largest biotechnology company on the planet. Calls up and says, I've seen your technologies and I've seen what your potential is to impact the world. I want to come and visit your company and help you and I'd like to be on your board of directors. What? Amazing. Tim Pawlenty calls. 
He's managing a finance group out in on the East Coast. He said, Dan, I've seen what you're doing in central Minnesota. I'd like to be part of your company. The World Health Organization calls and says, I understand you have a handheld robotic device that can detect Ebola in less than in 10 minutes with a saliva sample. We did. It wasn't FDA approved. Airports were shutting down all over the world because they couldn't detect who was carrying Ebola. This went on and on for a year. Bill and Melinda Gates called. We'd like your chief scientist to be one of 10 people to frame up a technology platform to bring to India and third world countries to do the same type of genetic sequencing and hybrid development that Syngenta Seeds and Pioneer Seeds have been doing for years. They sat next, my scientists sat next to Bill and Melinda Gates on this topic. This just happened. God shows up when you ask him and invite him into the visioning process. I could go on and on on tools, whether it's applying the hedgehog or the balanced scorecard from a biblical lens and looking for the leading indicators in a person's heart that's sitting next to you. They've been applied in, in businesses in Elk River and in Alexandria, Minnesota. But enough on the tools, because the tools are our time. But there's one thing that's more important than tools, and that's the virtues of Jesus Christ. You know, we all choose who we do business with, don't we? Our vocations. We choose. I mean, you say, ah, I'm not really. It's like, who's here is who's here. No, we have choices as we go through life. I'm just going to ask you, who are you doing faith at work with? And what does our heart look like? We have all been trained up in the importance of people. Jim Collins would say it in Good to Great. Hey, you got to put the right people on the bus, then put them in the right seats. We, we, we hear it all the time, right? It's important. I don't deny that. I, I don't deny that. And Stephen Covey Jr. would put it another way. We have to hire people that we trust. And Covey Jr., he actually, I love the way he puts it, he would basically say, trust isn't simple. It, it's not like this you know, really soft thing. Stephen Covey Jr. would basically say, trust, no, trust is made up of two really primary components. It's the character and it's the competency. Let me give you a quick example. Mike Sleddy, right sitting right here. If you, you guys know Mike? Okay, if you don't know Mike, you should know Mike. He is like one of the finest people in, in well, finest people on the planet. Mike Sleddy. I would trust him, Lisa would trust him with our family trust every day of the week and then some. Why? Because there's a man of integrity, of values, of caring, that take it to the bank. There's also a competency of finance that you would find hard pressed to find somebody more competent in that realm in this whole region. Character, competency. But you know what, if I've got a brain tumor, I'm not gonna trust Mike. <laughs> it's a good call, right? I'm not going to trust Mike because the competency piece falls apart. So Covey Jr. tells us, and you guys apply this in your organizations, you have a job description for an open position, and you put it out there, and you, you have the vetting process, application process, you've got interviewing teams, you're stack ranking, you're doing criminal background checks, you're doing drug che tests, you're doing all of that to evaluate, and then you're asking questions about the values alignment. Do they align with our integrity, our quality, our safety, and whatever your values might be? You do that well. The people in Alexandria are taking it one step further. They're taking this piece, the values piece, and they're saying the values are important. But we need to hire leaders into our organization that have the virtues of Christ. Where do they get that? Again, go back to scripture, go back to the Bible. The first 12 apostles were selected from ordinary men. All right, ordinary men. Some tax collectors, some Pharisees, some fishermen. And then the disciples that followed, they were ordinary people. But where did he take them first? He didn't take them to, let me teach you how to preach and teach school. He took them to an offsite called the Sermon on the Mount. And he said, here's what the heart and the virtues of Christ look like as you go about being sent. The virtues of caring, of love, of faith, and prayer, and hope, and compassion, and generosity, and on and on, the virtues of Christ. When people are hiring in Alexandria, Minnesota right now, this is who they're looking to do business with. The virtues of Christ in vocational discipleship. I, I can't tell you, I, I can't begin to express 
how powerful this is in building a community of transformation for the kingdom economy of precious coins. I'm going to give you a few examples. How am I doing, Lisa? You got to be my time check because, you know, I got so many words. Five minutes, so good one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're good. Okay, I'm good. We'll keep going. These examples, three examples. This good guy right here, you, you got to be careful you're not crying on this one. Okay? Gary Inman. So the first one, I actually call it the Carol story. And it's the story of Christ's virtue of love showing the heart of some business people that Lisa and I got to know really well. So here's how it goes. I leave IBM. I go to work at this little company, Great Plains Software. We got nothing at Great Plains Software when I go. I don't know what employee number I was, but it was small. All right? I was there for 12 years, but when I went, I literally, Mike, you were responsible for this. I shared a desk, I shared a wastebasket, and I shared a phone because we couldn't afford any more than that. But what I did find there were some people that had the heart and virtues of Christ. Two of them actually were named da uh, Thor and Dana Iverson. Um, Thor is an NDSU guy, Triple uh, E, CPA, and a Stanford MBA. Went to work for Hewlett Packard. His wife, wife was equally impressive. She worked at Hewlett Packard. They came to work, Great Plains Software. Doug was recruiting really smart people back to North Dakota, right? So here they are at Great Plains Software. We got to know them. What we found was, what their primary passion was, was Jesus Christ, all right? They loved Jesus. And Lisa and I got to know them really well, and we were starting young families early in our marriages. I said, well, let's do a Bible study in our home. So we decided to do a Bible study. Well, maybe we'll invite a few people from our neighborhoods and, our, and work. Yep, we did that every week. And you know what? It wasn't like some high platitude, ethical topics or whatever. We're studying the Bible. Dana worked with a lady at Great Plains Software, a director of marketing research. Her name is Carol Inman. If you were to look up in the dictionary the definition of human good, Carol's name is right there. This person, this is her brother, right here, Gary Inman. You want to see goodness? Go meet Gary, because Carol is just like Gary. She was the east, yeah. <laughs> She's so good. She's so talented. She was so fun. Jeff and I worked with her in another company as well. Fascinating person. But as Dana got to know Carol, they worked in the same department, she could see Carol was searching for something, something missing in, light, in her life, and you would never know that anything was missing in Carol's life. She was religious, attended church regularly, served. She's a great person. Through Dana's love and mentoring, Carol found a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and was never the same, right? Yeah. Now, Carol went on to work as an executive of Banner Health System. She came to work with Jeff and I at Be At Home, and um, Thor was at Be At Home as well. When we sold that company, Carol said, guys, don't worry. I'm going to land well because Echelon didn't need a marketing person. She said, I've been called to go to work for Billy Graham's daughter, Anne Graham Lotz. Any of you heard of her? Yeah, I see some, see some head shaking. Carol was an exceptional marketer. Great competency with the heart and virtues of Jesus Christ. Carol went ahead of Anne Graham Lotz and filled stadiums around the world in third world countries in Europe with women that had never heard the gospel in their entire lives. I love this about the kingdom economy because you never know how God's going to multiply it. Carol, a precious coin that has secured some eternal currency forever based upon what she's done. Thank you, Dana and Thor, for the virtue of Christ. Am I right, Gary? Yeah. Another one, real quick. I call it Chad's story. It's the mercy story. Douglas Scientific, because of our mission, we were able to attract some really cool people. One of the guys that I was able to hire out of retirement, his name was Lloyd Willard. Lloyd Willard was, um, he's got his name on a number of patents catheters that go through the coronary artery system and through the heart to affect um, heart disease and after surgery. Um, he worked for Boston Scientific and SciMed, and I was able to recruit him to Douglas Scientific. He was our CTO. Lloyd was also a great student and teacher of the Old Testament. Fascinating guy. 
One day, Lloyd walks into my office. He said, Dan, I'm going to ask you to consider something that is completely unconventional, and with all reason, you should say no. I said, well, that's a nice way to start, Lloyd. What do you got in your mind? He goes, a father that I know has a son who's 30 years old. He's got four little kids. His son has become addicted to prescription, prescription painkillers. He's broken into a number of homes in Ottertail and Douglas County. He has been convicted. He's incarcerated. He's getting out, and his dad wants me to try to get him on stable footing. I said, and? He goes, I want to hire him. He's a mechanical engineer. He's smart, but he's a risk. And I said, so what's, uh, what's the ask? He goes, our parent company that owns us, Douglas Machine, I'd started a startup using some technology out of their R&D. We're a separate company, but we still followed their guidelines. He said, Chad will not pass their criminal background check or their drug test. Fail it. And they were strict about this. I said, so what are you recommending? And he said, well, Dan, Jesus Christ gave you and I a second chance in life. And he goes, in Alexandria, Minnesota, where God is alive, in this company where we just live out the Christian ethic every day, if Chad can't get a job and a second chance here, where on this planet would he? The next morning, we formed up a, jo a job description and an offer for him. And Douglas Machine wasn't particularly happy about it, but we hired him. People over policy. Mercy, mercy over policy. Chad Smith became part of a team that developed an IntelliCube, which took five laboratory instruments and consolidated it into one. And this particular device is responsible for feeding people, identifying and, and, and doing pharmacogenomics down at the Mayo Labs, right, through a company named One Ohm. You can go Google this, you know, K, uh, Channel 9 in Minneapolis has done features on this particular instrument. Chad Smith was the centerpiece of the engineering team to develop this. But more importantly than that, Chad's little kids watched him get hauled away by the Ottertail County Sheriff, and his wife had $10 to her name. This family is now living in Battle Lake and flourishing. I get to fish with him once in a while. He's a marvelous fisherman, too. Kingdom economy. Lloyd had mercy. Last one. Prayer is happening everywhere in Alexandria. There are prayer lists, prayer meetings. It's not uncommon for people from various companies and school systems to show up at Douglas Scientific and literally pray over our technology products where we're running into technical obstacles. Praying for each other, going into their businesses, it's happening. And then, one last thing. Douglas Scientific grew really fast. Within seven years, our corporate value had eclipsed the corporate value of the company that owned us that was 55 years old. They couldn't afford to own us any longer. So we needed to go through a process of liquidating Douglas Scientific so they could afford to own us. They were an ESOP, okay? So went through a process, came down, number of companies, big private equity firms wanted to make offers on us, some did. Ended up with two very, very large companies. Not Roche Diagnostics, but let's just say really close. You can probably figure out who that would be in the biotech industry. Really large company. Makes a 100% cash offer on Douglas Scientific that was amazing. When I started Douglas Scientific, the board said, all we want you to do is try to get the money back that we've lost in the R&D, in the technology. I said, well, I'm not interested in doing that. But if you want to start a company that has a missional focus, Lisa and I and others will help you do that. Here they are with a cash offer that was way more than getting their money back. And a second offer from a company called LGC Genomics that had a mission that aligned with Douglas Scientific. Our employees wanted this one because we would stay alive and have jobs and affect the world. This cash offer, this big company just wanted to take us out of the game. Because that disruptive technology you just saw, it was basically eroding the revenue lines of this major company. My CFO, who is a former CFO at Swans USA, you remember Swans? Um, walks into me and he said, Dan, have you read this book, Circle Maker? And I said, no. Nope. He said, read it. I read it fast. And uh, he said, let's pull together everybody that's a constituent in this situation and write down the desires of our hearts. 
What we would want God to deliver through this impasse between Douglas Machine and Douglas Scientific is the board at Douglas Machine wanted the cash. We wanted LGC Genomics. Seemed irreconcilable. We circled it. We prayed about it. Every meeting ended with this. Pray. Have faith. It only takes one. God provided. Douglas Scientific has continued to grow. Douglas Machine got a really handsome cash and stock in LGC Genomics. And LGC has used Douglas Scientific as its North American headquarters since I've been, since I've been gone. As you think about these examples, three about the virtues of Christ, consider who you're working with in the spectrum of faith at work. Do you work with people who see into a person financial stress, marital stress, problems with kids, maybe searching, spiritual exploration, see it and are willing to step forward and address it just like Christ asked us to do as we were sent. As you think about that, I'm going to leave you with this. I am hypersensitive that what I've just described is increasingly important in the culture of the United States of America. There's a culture of godlessness that seems to be growing, of divisiveness, disunity, as faith has maybe already talked about to a degree. It's, it's growing. Here's something else that you may not be aware of. Any of you heard about this book? The Rise of the Nuns. This book is based on research. It's a few years old now, but only a few years old. This book is based upon research that's been happening in United States household, households since the 1950s. The study is called the American Religious Identification Survey. Survey shows up into US households. The head of household takes the survey after some demographic questions, is asked to respond to this. What religion do you have an affiliation with or an affinity to? Christianity, is it Catholicism, is it Pro Protestant, Islam, Hinduism, Mormonism, and various other sects of religion? And the last box has always been no religious affiliation, none. From that point, right, from that point of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, the percentage of U.S. households that checked none ranged between 5 and 8 percent until the 1990s. In the 1990s, it bounced up to 12 percent. Then 2000s, up to 15 percent. In 2016, it was 25 percent of households classified as none. It's estimated today that it's closer to 40% of US households have no religious affiliation. I'm not talking Christianity, I'm talking no religious affiliation, okay? So the more alarming part of this is the age breakdown of the data. In age groups less than 30 years old, it's estimated that there's greater than 50% that classify nuns. Therein lies the title of the book. What's the prognostication? Well, this demographic doesn't go to church. If they do, it's very infrequently. So where do they not have? Do they not have spiritual inquisitions? Of course, they ask the same questions you and I do. Why do I exist? What's my destiny? Where, what's after this life? They're asking the same questions. Where are they getting answers? The role of the church is diminishing. The role of vocation is increasing. Are we prepared, whether we're students at Concordia being prepare, prepared for the affairs of the world or us being sent in our vocations? The stakes and the consequences of the kingdom economy, eternity, are high. Who are you doing vocation with? I'm not going to leave you with a downer because I'm an, up, I'm an upbeat guy about this. I love vocational ministry. And you know what? I couldn't listen to music for 15 years, so it's not like I know any new jingle that it kind of expresses my optimism. But you know what? I read a hymn every morning in my devotional time. I love the hymns of old. Every morning I read a hymn. And there's one I think that gives me great hope, you know, with this, uh, this situation that we're dealing with, our United States of America and vocational ministry. And it's the old hymn. You guys know it. Maybe you do, unless you're young. Gary, you probably don't know it. You're young. This is... God's, this is God's world. It's our time. It's God's world. 
This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. Why? Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king. Let the heavens ring. <laughs> Let the earth be glad. God reigns. Let the earth be glad. We should be glad. It's his time. I'm excited about what we can do in vocation. I'm excited for what I've seen done down I-94 corridor and what will continue to be done in organizations, churches, schools, businesses that commit their vocational um, existence to a kingdom economy using great secular tools and the virtues of Christ. Soli Deo Gloria. To God be the glory. Yeah. Faith, do we have time for a few questions? Just a couple. Yeah. Just I, a am, couple. I am willing to take anything. But you can tell I'm a little extemporaneous. I, whatever comes out, God put there. All right. Any questions? Yep, we have one here. He always has a question. Yeah. So uh, I want to say again, merci beaucoup for sharing all your uh, knowledge with us. But I uh, had a question. I, I truly believe in uh, the power of mentorship, but as well as visualization. And I was thinking when you're speaking uh, of uh, Jesus, of uh, servant leadership, I'm thinking how do you, throughout your career or throughout examples, how can you share with us some takeaways of how do we, on a daily basis, when we enter leadership or um, roles where we have uh, influence on other people, how do we push as much as we can as human, uh, push our ego away from sometimes making decisions? Because it is something that is very um, flattering when people look up to you or people, like you said, I loved when you said the example of people tell you you're a visionary and you chuckle. Yep. But I mean, it is flattering when someone tells you this. So how do you, is there any takeaways or daily practices you can tell us of how to push away that ego of people maybe looking up to you or, yeah. yeah. That is a, it's a fabulous question because, you know, if you're in a leadership pr position, it's probably because people are, are th th you're a bit of a magnet, you might be contagious, and you're probably also quite successful, um, which drives what? Pride. And one of the virtues of Christ is humility. And I would just, I have to remind myself of this. You know, be humble before God. He is so so much bigger, so much more loving, so much more compassionate, so much wiser than I am. So if someone had come to me and they're looking for some kind of guidance, I am reminded very quickly to pause and say, I want to pour into this person's life or mentor them, but I'm going to pause and stop, and even if it's briefly, and pray on their behalf that God works through me, not me works through me. It's just, that's how, I, that's how I address those kind of situations. And believe me, people who've worked with me know that I, I have my own ego. I have my own pride. I'm confident beyond belief. Um, but I have to remind myself of the modesty in the, the glorious face of an almighty, holy, all-powerful God. I am just a little guy, but I have the power through him to minister to people and mentor to mentor them. It's just a reminder. It's a daily reminder for me, by the way. Okay, other questions? Yes. Hello, I'm Phil Hansen, and there's Sylvia Lell, right there. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, maybe you are heroes to people like me right now. I just pray that you are. That <laughs> tap on the shoulder. I, I would love to tell you that Sylvia Lell story in more, um, more, than, more than brevity. It was amazing. But thank you for doing what you do. Thank you. Yes. Um, so from the career, we both are in the career center. And from a career perspective, we're a little bit larger than it was in the day when you were here. And, and our staff has the opportunity to interact with current Concordia students. What message would you like us to share with those students? And particularly if they're a Concordia student that might check that none box. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, 
here's Lisa and I actually. It's my wife Lisa's over over here. You know, she, wow. Some people say I'm really lucky, and I say, seriously? It's like I'm five seven. I got gray hair. Um, I'm deaf, and you call me lucky. And then I look at my wife, and I go, Yeah, I am pretty lucky. <laughs> you know, we do we do business invocation together, and actually, right now we are. Um, we lead a Bible study in our homes with six uh, millennial uh, couples that have asked us to be mentors to them. And three of them are actually entrepreneurs. They're, so they're all like 30 years old and raising young families and so forth. We have learned so much about them and what we don't know about the younger generations and how they process and evaluate um, how they evaluate spiritual things and vocational things. Here is what I know about them, and you know more than I do, so I'm not an expert here. Lisa and I feel blessed because we're able to learn from them, about them. Here is what I do know. They are not willing to take the older generation's pat amp answers and quips and routine answers about anything. Right, I actually, right now, I'm leading an apologetics um, study with them. And, you know, you can go back and you can read a Josh McDowell apologetics, and he's got, he's got evidence and he's got answers for pretty much any apologetics questions. I'm telling you what, they look at that and they start breaking it apart and processing it and like going, I, I, I don't, here was an answer we actually got, was it two nights ago? Yeah, here's an answer we got from them on one question that was in the apologetics. It's like, yeah, these are the same generational guys that gave us the food pyramid. <laughs> they question everything and process it. So my answer to you would be this. And so it actually aligns with the mentoring question. I would encourage them to seek out vocations and employment and leaders that are spiritually grounded but mentally open-minded to process their career questions, their spiritual exploration questions in a non-threatening and non, here's the way it is, black and white and absolute. Because if you're doing that, if they get into that environment, they will be immensely frustrated. So seek leaders that are grounded, but open and can process and have an iterative dialogue, a healthy dialogue, and be willing to be challenged. All right, they will challenge virtually everything, as what, is what Lisa and I ha have noted. That would be my advice. Find vocational leaders that they can, early in their career, by the way, this is a Burgum quote from World Cup Racing, you never have to recover from a fast start. Think about that for a minute. If you're in World Cup Racing and you get out second, you're constantly in the tail, all right, and trying to catch up. It's the same thing in vocation. Find a leader early that's willing to help you process through those kind of things in vocation. Yay. Okay? That is a wonderful answer. I will take it, use it in class, because they do ask those questions and they are not afraid to ask hard questions. Nope. Thank you so much, Dan, for You're sharing welcome. with us. Thank you all for coming. Shall we thank Dan together? <laughs> And we hope to see you next month for our next Lawrence and luncheon. Thank you. <laughs>